2023. Oh, it's telling me recording. Um, our civic buzz for this month is a presentation by Secretary of State Steve Simon. Steve Simon is Minnesota's 22nd Secretary of State. He was sworn into office January 5th, 2015 as Minnesota's Chief Elections Administrator. He pledged in his inaugural, can't say that word, <laughs> address to work with anyone of any political affiliation from any part of our state to protect, defend, and strengthen the right to vote in Minnesota. As Secretary of State, he partners with township, city, and county officials to organize elections on behalf of Minnesota's nearly 4 million eligible voters and ensure the election system is fair. We'll start tonight with Secretary Simon presenting an overview of the many voting-related laws that were passed by the 2023 legislature. After the presentation, there will be time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can use the raise hand icon, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or type your questions in the chat. My colleague, Diane Venters, will monitor the chat and pose those questions, and we'll call on those who have their hands raised. So without any further ado, Secretary of State Steve Simon. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And hello, everyone. Great to be with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you again. I've been with you before. This isn't my first time. And one of the favorite things of mine to do is to talk to league chapters around the state, sometimes in person, sometimes uh, by Zoom like this. I always appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and I see many familiar faces so far on this call. I want to thank Mark Bonhorst for being the one to originally put the bug in my ear about this particular event. So thank you, Mark. He and I have collaborated on uh, uh, on a couple of things in particular over the years, and I always appreciate his insights. I hope we'll get some of them today. Um, I want to say just a broader thing about the League as an organization statewide and no doubt um, with your particular chapter. And that is that you have been, for me and for our office, an indispensable collaborator on strengthening and shoring up democracy, on making changes that I think uh, have been needed to our election system, which I'll discuss tonight, and generally speaking, just being a great um, bulwark, I guess I might say, against um, some really troubling disinformation there about our election system. Always rigorously nonpartisan, which I appreciate, which is important to our office as well, but just making sure that voters because this is about the voters, get the facts that are true and accurate about our election system. As I've said many time, times, when I talk about disinformation, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about disagreement, and I know neither are you. There are reasonable, honest, honorable, patriotic, ethical people who might disagree with me, and perhaps with you, about elections policy. But when I talk about disinformation, I'm talking about a willful attempt to spread knowingly false information about our election system, not having a debate about what the system ought to be. That is absolutely fair game always and forever. But we should be able to come to some consensus about what the system is, how it operates, what the facts of it are. And I so appreciate the League of Women Voters year in and year out being a consistent partner with our office and many others in pushing back against that sort of dangerous disinformation. So I'm here to today to talk about laws, particularly new laws. And let me just put that in a little bit of context, at least from where I sit. And that is that, um, as you may know, I hope you do, because you and the league are partly responsible for it, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota is really, really good at voting. We're good at it because we like to do it and we have great partners like the league who enable it um, where people are eager, eager to do it. So Minnesota is really good at voting. So good, in fact, as you may know, that for three out of the last four elections, we were number one in the country, including during the COVID election of 2020, when despite a lot of anxiety and even fear, Minnesota was number one in the country in voter turnout. Um, and I get asked a lot, as you might imagine, why I think that is. What is it about us in Minnesota that makes us perennial champions when it comes to voting? Is it something in the water? Is it pure coincidence? Is it dumb luck? What is it? Well, it won't surprise you to know that I don't think it's any of those things. I think it's a number of things, um, but I want to focus on one of them tonight. And, and that one, perhaps the biggest one, is that we have had good laws on the books that tend to enable voting. And I'm not just talking about the last few years, I'm talking about the last few decades. And these are laws that were put there on the books in Minnesota by Democrats and Republicans over the last 50 or so years that are very much pro-voter. 
that are very much pro-access, but that are careful to balance, as any system should, um, access and security. Those are the two things, and they need not be in conflict. They can be harmonized, and we've shown the rest of the country how to harmonize those two things, access and security. They aren't opposites. They blend together to make what I think is a very effective system, and the numbers don't lie. So as many of you know, because you've been a part of them, uh, Minnesota has, as I said, had the advantage of some really good laws on the books. I think that the jewel in the crown of our good laws on the books is election day or same day voter registration, which the league, I understand, was quite helpful in passing in 1973. Yes, 50 years ago. So since 1973, we've been one of the relatively few states. All these years later, there are only 15 or 16 states like us where there is no pre-election cutoff. In the rest of America, in the other two thirds or so of states, um, it's a very different situation. As many of you know, because maybe you've lived in some of these states, in most of the rest of America, there's a pre-election cutoff, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes four weeks before election day. And if a person is not registered to vote by that pre-election cutoff, that person can't vote, that's it. It doesn't matter if they were registered to vote properly at a different address um, for years or even decades up to that point. It doesn't matter if the person was confused or forgot or couldn't get there in time. That's it. It's an absolute cutoff and it's an end uh, to any participation. Not so in Minnesota, where, as you know, any voter. I want something else. Any voter who's eligible to vote can go into a polling place on Election Day either having never voted or registered or having voted or registered maybe elsewhere, maybe they had an address change, maybe they had a name change and they can register to vote. So that is the primary example, I think, of a law that has put us in a really good situation and a really good position to be champions in voting. Others include things like online voter registration or the ability of every single eligible voter in Minnesota to vote from home. That more than anything, in my opinion, saved the 2020 election and not only saved it, but enabled us to get through it with flying colors, number one in American voter turnout. Because during a very difficult, challenging and fearful time, people didn't wanna to go to big public places. And so they were able in Minnesota as they were nationwide in, in most places to vote from home. So that is just an example. Uh, those are some examples of a few of the laws that I'm talking about at least, there are others, but those are a few examples of laws that have put us in a really good position to be number one. And even when we're not number one at the very top of the list. This year though, in the Minnesota legislature, um, we saw a, a group of bills pass that was more impactful than anything we have seen in Minnesota in 50 years, since 1973, since the time that we passed um, uh, election day or same day voter registration. And it's hard to top 1973, but I think this legislature did it. This was by any measure, any reasonable measure, the most impactful legislature since 1973, probably on a host of issues, but I'm gonna to stick to my lane tonight and talk about democracy issues. I like often to say that I and we in our office are in the democracy business, and it is a heck of a time to be in the democracy business, particularly as we inch towards, it's not inching anymore, it's sort of hurtling towards the 2024 election, which by the way, is just around the corner. People think of it as November of 2024. Oh, no. As many of you know, we have a presidential nominating primary in Minnesota that is on two Super Tuesday, which this next year will be March 5th, 2024. But the absentee voting period for that presidential primary begins on January 19th. January 19th. That is really just around the corner. So these new tools, these new rules, these new laws are going to be crucial in the upcoming presidential election. So. I want to talk just a little bit about what some of those are. Uh, I can't mention all of them because we don't have time, um, but I'm interested in telling you my perspective on a few of them. Let's start with one that I know many in the league have worked on, as have I, for a number of years, and as have many other around uh, the state of Minnesota. And that is the restoration of the freedom to vote for people who have left prison behind. That finally got done this year after um, a long, long fight over many, many years. Some of you know that before this law was passed in Minnesota, which took effect on June 1st, Minnesota was in the plurality of states that said that 
the right to vote would only be restored, not when someone was released from incarceration, but years and in some cases decades afterwards when they were done with the so-called on paper part of their sentence. The challenge in Minnesota had been that in Minnesota, sentences tend to have an inordinate number, or at least compared to other states, a large number of years of on paper, of supervised release, of, of probation, of the like. So in, in some particularly extreme cases, people would be on paper for decades, decades before getting the right to vote back. One of the prominent plaintiffs in one of the lawsuits that was brought uh, committed a federal drug a possession crime in her late 20s, uh, served two or three years in federal prison, and would not otherwise have had her right to vote restored until she was in her early 70s, early 70s, a nearly 40-year term of on paper, only two or three years of incarceration. The rest was all on paper. That made no sense. And so now 55,000 or more Minnesotans have had their right to vote restored. The real challenge going forward now that this has passed is to get that news to the people affected. We have 55,000 plus people in Minnesota now who have the freedom to vote restored to them, but many of them don't know it. And the job of our office and a broad coalition of folks around Minnesota, I think including the league, is to let them know about it. Whether they vote and certainly who they vote for is none of our business, um, but we want them to at least understand that they have that freedom to vote, to use or not use as they see fit. So we're working with the Department of Corrections, we're working, working with a host of community groups around the state to get the word out between now and November of 2024. 55,000 people. That is certainly a big deal and a big impactful change. Um, another one that I wanna mention is something called automatic voter registration. It's called automatic voter registration, but I've often wished that it went by a different title because the word automatic can be misleading. In this case, I think to some extent it is. Um, most people, me included, when they think of something being automatic, they think of it being done without human influence maybe a computer program or um, you know, an algorithm or something is doing something without human judgment involved. That's not what this is. What automatic voter registration really is, is really just an adjustment to something we've already had for decades in state law. Minnesota, like almost every state, has what's called a motor voter law, motor voter. We've had it since 1993 in Minnesota, so for 30 years. And it means, and some of you have taken advantage of this or know others who have, it means that in Minnesota, when you get or when you renew a driver's license, you have the option, if you're otherwise eligible, you're a citizen, you're 18 and so forth, you have the option, or you had the option before, even before this law was passed, of checking a box on a form. I noticed it the last time I got my driver's license renewed a couple of years ago. There's a form. And on the box, uh, on that form, there's a box that says, check here if you wish to be registered to vote. And the reason for that is the very same information that you're supplying to get or renew a driver's license, namely, you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live. Well, that's the same stuff that we need to register someone to vote. So that was the previous, that was the existing law. All that automatic voter registration means is it sort of reverses the presumption. If someone is otherwise eligible to vote and goes in to renew or get a driver's license, they will be presumed to wish to vote. There is no more box to check. Um, it's just a presumption that someone who's otherwise eligible will wish to be registered to vote and then will be. But real human beings, not a robot, not a computer program, real human beings are still making judgment calls on whether someone is eligible to vote based on proof of citizenship, based on other databases that we and the Department of Public Safety uh, subscribe to, uh, there's a determination about whether a person is even put in the line or put in the pile to be registered to vote. So there are always humans at the forefront of this process, making real actual judgments. That's why the term automatic voter registration, I think is not the best descriptor of this particular reform. But the bottom line is this will make a big dent. This will, um, uh, we will see a substantial increase in the number of people who are registered to vote among those four to 500,000 in Minnesota who are eligible to vote 
but not yet registered. Those eligibles, but not yet registered. Again, a little north of 400,000, somewhere in there. And we'll also see a corresponding decline, probably uh, a, a steep decline in people even having the need for same day voter registration. It'll still be there as a stopgap and as a safety net, but a large majority of those who would otherwise need to register same day won't need to sa register same day because they'll already have been in the system weeks and in most cases, months earlier. That's good not only from the standpoint of access, that's good from the standpoint of security. It's going to strengthen our voting roles and make them even more secure than they are right now, even more accurate than they are right now. So that I think is a big win. A related reform I wanna to call to your attention and one that I know the league statewide has been very involved with because I've been by their side over the last few weeks in many places around the state is pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. This is a big deal and also really an adjustment to something we had in state law. Many of you know, because you've been on those visits to high schools where you're trying to register voters. We already, before any of this, we had a law on the books in Minnesota that said if someone is 17 but will be 18 by the next election, they can, in essence, get in line to register. That's all that pre-registration is. It's not actual registration, but it's getting in line to register. And all we've done in Minnesota now is said, instead of 17-year-olds who will be 18 by the next election, now it's just all 17-year-olds and all 16-year-olds, regardless of whether they'll be 18 by the next election, they can pre-register to vote. And what does that mean? It means getting in line. It means filling out the same form, typically online, but it can also be on paper providing information and certifying that they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live. And if everything checks out, if real human beings making real judgment calls certify that those things are true, then without that person have to, having to do anything, think about anything, mess with anything, boom, on their 18th birthday, they will be added to the voting rolls. And by the way, this isn't just happy talk. This isn't just uh, about hopefulness. We know from reliable studies nationwide that this has a real and true effect and impact on the number of young people who not only end up registering to vote, but end up actually voting. States as varied as Hawaii and Florida have seen actual upticks. So this is driven by real information, real reliable information. And I should say, by the way, if I didn't before, all of these reforms that I'm gonna talk about tonight, all of them, are bipartisan or really nonpartisan in origin and nonpartisan in effect. Let me just repeat that. They are all, each and every one of them, nonpartisan in origin and nonpartisan in effect. And let me just give you one example. The pre-registration law that I just talked about. So when we were lobbying for that in the legislature this year, I reached out to my colleague in Louisiana, the Louisiana Secretary of State. He and I are of different political parties and different political orientations and persuasions. We see a lot of issues very differently from one another, but we get along really well. And I have great respect for him. And so when I, um, when I was in the position this session of, of lobbying for this and pushing legislators to enact this, I reached out to him. And at my invitation, he agreed to write a letter to members of the Senate and members of the House. And what he basically said in the letter, I'm obviously summarizing and paraphrasing, is he said, look, I understand that you are taking a look at doing pre-registration in Minnesota. Not only do we have this law in Louisiana, we love this law in Louisiana, and you would do well in Minnesota to adopt it. Now, he and I couldn't be very much more different when it comes to our politics and our policy preferences. But on this, we agreed. And it's an example, again, Louisiana, a very stereotypically red state, I think we could all agree, having adopted this years ago and really liking it, according to their Secretary of State. So that's why I, I always hasten to emphasize that these are nonpartisan in origin and nonpartisan in effect. No political party, not the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, not any other party will benefit in any particular way from the passage of these reforms. Um, so we've talked about restoration of voting rights. We've talked about automatic voter registration. We've talked about pre-registration for high school students. Those tend to get a lot of headlines. But what about those that aren't uh, getting the headlines or getting the, you know, the attention uh, in the media or on social media? I wanted to talk about at least a couple of those as well. One is uh, something that I have been pushing for since I was a legislator which is we now have the ability for any voter to sign up to be on a permanent absentee list. Um, uh, many states have this, red states, blue states, and states in between. It means if you are really decided that voting absentee, voting mostly by mail is the way that you'd like to vote, 
you can sign up on a list and guarantee that that's that without having to ask or reapply every election, that's how you will get your ballot from now on. It will be mailed to you. Uh, it's worked very well in other states. And I think that's going to um, add to the mix and it's going to augment uh, the mix of voting that we have in Minnesota. Um, clearly, uh, during the COVID election, in the, we, we saw a massive increase in Minnesota and nationwide of the number of voters choosing to vote absentee, mostly by mail. In fact, in Minnesota in 2020, 58%, 58%, that's a pretty large majority, voted absentee. Only 42% in the COVID election of 2020 in Minnesota, only 42% voted the traditional way in a polling place on election day. Now, that 58% number came way back down to earth two years later in 2022, I think for obvious reasons, and it was at 26%. So a re reliably one quarter of voters, and I predict it's going to continue uh, a march to about one third or so in the coming years, um, prefer to vote that way. And this makes it easier for voters to vote that way. So that's one other one. We also finally got time off for all uh, methods of voting. We already had a law in the books, a sensible one that we've had for some time that requires um, employers to give time off for work uh, for voting on election day. But seeing as how a large and growing chunk of Minnesotans don't necessarily want to vote on election day, the law was expanded this year to account for absentee voting. So in other words, employers now have to give time off, reasonable time off to all employees for voting, even if that includes going to a courthouse, going to a community center, going to city hall, wherever it is that that voter would vote by absentee during the 46 day absentee period. So that's another one. It's not a headline grabber, not one that you're going to see, uh, um, you know, talked about in public so frequently, but I think it's an important one. Another one, election worker protection, something that unfortunately we need to have. Now, Minnesota is in a better position than, than some other places I could mention in America where this has been a real problem. But the bottom line is we cannot have our election workers, whether they're people who are working, who are election judges working just that day, uh, or election administrators who do the job year round, we can't have them the subject of threats, harassment, or intimidation. This, at least nationwide in some spots, is a serious problem. In Minnesota, we have had isolated incidents, isolated but serious incidents. We want to keep them isolated. We don't want them to grow. So we added some penalties. Our office uh, helped draft the language and helped get it passed. Some, some augmented penalties for those who would harass, threaten, or intimidate people who are doing their jobs. And by the way, um, this uh, isn't and should never be an excuse to interfere with someone's First Amendment rights. If anyone in a polling place or anywhere else, an election counter and a county or city offer, office wants to take a strong opinion, wants to be critical or skeptical or angry or express themselves in an angry way, I think that's perfectly fine. You know, uh, speaking for myself and for other elections administrators, you know, that's what we have the First Amendment. If they want to call us names or they want to say bad things or, you know, question our honesty or integrity, that's their right to do. That is not harassment. Uh, that is not threats. That is not intimidation. But let me give you some real world examples from Minnesota. I won't name the people or the places. There was one county election administrator who told me that a member of her staff was followed to her car in a parking lot in the dark after hours by someone who was upset and agitated over an election issue. That goes beyond First Amendment speech. That's conduct. That's not just speech. How about this one? How about the election administrator in another part of the state who told me that she was repeatedly called on her home phone over the weekend by someone who wouldn't leave her alone about an elections related issue or grievance. That too goes beyond just expressing a strong opinion or strongly expressing an opinion. That's okay. You can have whatever opinion you want about the person, the office, the election system, anything you want. But that too, I think most people would agree, goes above uh, or, or goes beyond any sort of first amendment protection. And then the final example, probably the most egregious, is an election administrator, again, yet a third county in Minnesota, who was physically accosted at her workplace by a citizen who was angry and upset over an election related issue. Again, he can be as angry as he wants, he can be as contemptuous as he wants or insulting as he wants, but to make physical contact with a person, that's conduct. That is not simply someone having an opinion or a speech. So now we have, I think, extra tools in law that make that kind of thing less likely. And if it does happen, make sure that we can deal with it effectively and swiftly 
uh, and give it the sort of um, attention that it deserves. And then the final one I want to highlight uh, for you before we open it up for not just your questions, but your answers, has to do with election disinformation. Again, as I said before, when I talk about disinformation, I am not talking about disagreement, even strongly expressed disagreement. I'm talking about um, false information um, used for um, an insidious purpose. And the bill that the Minnesota legislature passed and that we um, helped get passed would say that someone who spreads information that they know is false, so two major elements, they spread knowingly false information and it's not enough if they just spread knowingly false information, they spread knowingly false information and they do it with the intention of interfering with another person's right to vote. If both things are true, not one or the other, they know that it's false and they spread it with the intention, the express purpose of interfering with someone's right to vote, then that is now subject to new penalties in Minnesota law. And let me give you an example in case you're wondering, well, what, what, what might fit into that box? Let me give you an example, not from Minnesota, but from another state, from an election 20 or more years ago. I've actually seen a copy of this. It was a flyer. It was a paper leaflet that was handed out in particular neighborhoods in a particular city during a presidential election. And it was about the week before the election. And it basically said, hey, attention residents, as you know, there's an election next Tuesday. But remember, only voters whose last names are A through L vote on Tuesday. Those with last names M through Z will vote on Wednesday. Just a reminder. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the sum and substance of the flyer. Now, that would meet the standard. That is something that surely was knowingly false, knowingly false and was disseminated for the express purpose of messing with or interfering with someone's right to vote. So that's a high bar. The First Amendment creates a high bar, as it should. The bar should be high. Um, it, it, it should be um, uh, only, th these kinds of penalties should only be reserved for things um, that are the most extreme and the most harmful. Um, but that's another example of one that isn't a big headline gra grabber, but ought, ought to give some peace of mind when we, and I say we, all of us, um, battle disinformation, not disagreement, not a difference of opinion on election law or policy, but outright disinformation intended to interfere with someone's right to vote. So I wanna thank you for your time and attention. I hope we can devote the next part of this to a great exchange. And again, I'm looking for not just your questions, but your answers, your advice, your wisdom, your pushback, your criticism, whatever you have. And I hope we have a lively discussion. So thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Simon. So now is time. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat. <clears throat> or if you have, um, I'm looking at the bottom of my screen. There are no questions the... in the chat. I'm sorry? There are no questions in the chat. Okay, so we have some, we have one hand raised, Margaret Berg. I am. Thank you, Steve. I love all the things that you're doing. <clears throat> the one thing that I'm starting to get a little squeamish about is the extreme, at least I'm calling it extreme, early voting. I'm concerned that a lot of times campaigns are just getting underway in the fall, and then all of a sudden, it's time to vote. And I feel like six weeks is too early in many, in many cases. So I'm just curious what you have to say about that. Yes, thank you for that question. And good to see you, Margaret. Um, uh, and thank you for participating. Um, so a couple things about that. Minnesota's absentee period is 46 days. That means 46 days before any primary and any election, including the presidential primary next year, um, people can start voting. Uh, by absentee, obviously. And that means either one of two things, either in-person absentee, where someone can show up at a city hall, community center, courthouse, wherever, and they can vote in person, or as you know, by mail. Um, and and you're not alone, Margaret, in, in saying, boy, that, that's an awful long time. I mean, a lot can happen in 46 days. There could be a debate. There could be a scandal. There could be an ad that changes your mind. There could be um, any number of things that could change a voter's mind. And that, that is true, but a couple of responses to that, I think. Number one, um, this 
was at least initially passed. I remember because I was in the legislature, I was at the signing ceremony for this one as a legislator. This was passed, honestly, the driving force, I would say, was to assist overseas Minnesotans, either military or business people or missionaries or diplomats or exchange students or whatever, because it's sometimes very difficult in the states with a shorter absentee period. By the time the ballots are um, printed and then assembled and then mailed to someone on a military base in Afghanistan or to that exchange student in London or to that Honeywell employee in Tokyo or whoever it is, um, and then you have to leave time for them to mail it back as well, Tragically, before this law was passed, and I think it was like 2009 or 10 or something like that, there would always be a pile of spoiled ballots that didn't get, make it back in time. So the idea was to grow it. Um, the other, though, response is, and this is something that is that isn't so well known, but we have a clawback law in Minnesota, which means that if you vote on day minus 46, the rule has been that you can claw back that ballot. You can change your mind, in other words. Go to your election office and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I made a terrible mistake on, can, on, on uh, the county commissioner race. I voted for candidate A, it should have been candidate B. Or I saw this debate, what was I thinking? I cast my ballot for candidate B. It's clear that I made the wrong choice. You can claw it back up to one week before the election. Why one week? Because that has been the date by which that, that is the date on which elections administrators can start opening all of those absentee ballots um, that have been voted. Now, that period, it was traditionally one week. Now it's two weeks. So the, the rule going forward uniformly will be up until two weeks before the election, you can claw it back. Now, it is true. You take a risk when you vote absentee. Let's say you vote absentee and on day minus six before the election or day minus five, something happens, a scandal, an ad, a debate, whatever, then you are out of luck because you're no longer in that clawback period. So that is a risk of voting absentee. There's no question. I need to be honest about that. It is a risk that um, you're locking yourselves in. Uh, uh, you're locking yourself in for 14 days before the election. But I just wanted to give you some context for that. And I would say, Thanks. by the way, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I will never forget the time that I was flying home from Spain and I looked over the shoulder of the person on the airplane ahead of me and he was reading the New York Times about, oh my gosh, what's his name? Who who was in the swimming in the swimming pool? Oh, Grunsa? <laughs> yes, Grunset? John Grunset. Yes. <laughs> and I... I, that was like a week before the general election, and he had to, he got out of the race, and Arnie Carlson stepped in, yeah. and he was the candidate. So it it does happen. It does happen. There's no question about it. It would be I I can't say any other thing than you're right. It's possible. It, you know, which is why voting absentee, though very convenient, um, there is some risk. No question. So we have a question in the, the um, chat uh, from Nan Carey, and she's asking about Native American voters. Yes. Whether we, what approaches we're taking to engage, engage more of those Native Americans who are living remotely. Yes, thank you so much for that question. It, it gives me the chance to talk about something that I'm very, very proud about, uh, proud of. Um, this also comes under the category of one that may not get huge headlines, but it's one that I'm particularly proud of. Um, and I'm proud of it because we got language into law that was not a bill. This is getting a little bit um, in, in the weeds. I know Margaret knows uh, what I'm talking about and others, but like this wasn't, we got something in law that was not a bill. It was language that we crafted and drafted that sort of hitched a ride, you might say, on another bill but no one introduced this language. It came from our office, working with partners, obviously, around the state. And it says that for the first time, we think in state history, any county that contains Indian or Native American land, like a, a reservation, must for at least one day of the absentee period, at least one day, have a physical presence on that land. 
Now, let me zoom out for a little bit and tell you why that's so important. We get frequent reports from folks who live on Native American reservations about hardships in voting, about confusion about voting, and about their struggle in many cases, but not all cases, I want to say, it's not universal, to get the counties in which they're situated to cooperate with them on physical polling places, either on election day or during the absentee period a physical place where they could vote physically on the reservation or on the Indian land and not have to go into a neighboring town or city or anything like that, where they could physically stay on the reservation. Now, there are some counties who have really stepped up. Others have not. So this is now a rule, and we think a reasonable one, that says of the 46 days of the absentee period, we don't think it's a hardship. We're not saying to any county, you have to be there the whole 46 days with a polling place. We're not even saying you have to be there for two days, but you do have to be there for one day. It's a floor, not a ceiling. You can be there for 10 days or all 46 days, but you must at least be physically there on one day. Doesn't seem like a lot to ask, but it will grant a tremendous amount of peace of mind. And I know from discussions with tribal chairs, tribal leaders of all kinds, with all 11 of Minnesota's federally recognized Indian or Native American tribes, that this could really be a big deal to a lot of people. So we got that done. And now for the first time in state history, um, they have to cooperate at least for a day, at least for a day. And, and we'll see how that goes in 2024, whether that period needs to be enlarged, whether that floor needs to be raised beyond just the one day. But for now, um, no county can refuse, at least for a day, being um, on those lands with a physical presence where people can physically vote in person. So that's one example. Thank you. Uh, Jan, you have your, haze, your hand raised. Hi, I'm Jan Nipple. And this question, I think someone else has asked it in the chat as well. And it's not exactly an election question, but it is a question about uh, driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants, yes. um, which is, I think is wonderful. But I do hear people saying, but then they're going to be able to vote. So I know yeah. you can speak to this, so I'll let you do that. I can. And thanks for the question, because I do get it and others get it. And it's a completely reasonable one, by the way. I don't blame anyone anywhere in Minnesota for saying, wait a minute, time out here, time out. I'm hearing two things happen to the legislature. On the one hand, undocumented immigrants can now get driver's license. On the other hand, I hear all this talk about automatic voter registration at the driver's license office. So can you assure me, please, that um, we're not going to have undocumented people registered automatically or otherwise to vote when they are not eligible to vote because they're not U.S. citizens? Excellent, totally fair question. The answer to that is, um, first of all, just to put it in so historical perspective, this is not a new challenge for the folks who administer driver's licenses, which are it's our State Department of Public Safety. In fact, my own mother is an example. My mother, for over 30 years, was a green card holder in Minnesota. She was not a U.S. citizen, and there she was for 30 years driving around with a driver's license. So it's not a new thing. It's not a new category of thing that there are people on the roads, like my mother, uh, who are not eligible to vote. 16 and 17-year-olds have driver's licenses. They're not eligible to vote. Some people under guardianship uh, are under driver's license, and they're not eligible to vote in many cases. And of course, some immigrants, like my mother, legal immigrants are not eligible to vote. Um, so I just want to tell people this is not some new challenge or new thing that the Department of Public Safety has to stand up to. So they've been doing this for decades. My mom came to this country in 1967. So, um, but the, the short answer to the question is under this new law, this automatic voter registration law, the only people who will even be put in the pile, even put in the pile for consideration to be registered to vote are those who have shown proof of citizenship, typically by use of a US passport or a birth certificate. That's the only people who will even be put in the pile, let alone um, screened uh, in terms of they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live. So I have full faith in the Department of Public Safety because they've tackled this category of challenge for decades and decades. I trust them when they say, they're, they have figured out the way through this proof of citizenship that we're not going to have undocumented folks who are inadvertently or otherwise registered to vote. 
Uh, thank you, Secretary um, Simon. What about those persons who just have state IDs? Same so, thing. Same thing. It, it applies. Yep. To them. So when they apply for a state ID, they also will be put in that file? Correct. Okay. Thank you. If and only if they are otherwise eligible to vote. Correct. So they've applied for a state ID or renewed a state ID and they're 18 and they're a citizen of the United States and they're a resident of the state of Minnesota. Only if those things are true will they be considered for the screening process to determine that they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live. Okay, thank you. Um, Lisa Mills, you wanted to ask your question or you want me to read it? <laughs> I'll read it. A priority for the Minnesota League is transparency and campaign finance. Did yes. we pass any laws to limit super PACs and secret donors to protect representative democracy? Uh, the answer, thanks for the question. The answer is yes. No, that's not our particular lane. As many of you know, there's a, a, a separate independent body in Minnesota called the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board, mm -hmm. which consists of equal numbers of representatives appointed by Democrats and Republicans. They're the campaign finance police, so to speak. But it's, it's a fair question. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, while it didn't go as far as some would like, it, um, it did get rid of the loophole the express advocacy loophole. There were a lot of groups that could raise a lot of undisclosed money that could hang their hats on a loophole. I'm mixing my metaphors. Hang, hang their hats on the fact that um, you only had to um, do certain reporting or jump through certain hoops in state law if you were expressly advocating, if you said the words vote for or vote against, but you could say almost anything else and you wouldn't be subject to the same regulation. The express advocacy uh, law is now more common sense to bring within its orbit more people who are um, pretty clearly advocating for or against candidates without saying the magic words vote for or support or anything like that. That's one. Another one is a new reporting requirement um, for PACs who get more than 1% of their uh, take or their donations, more than 1% from uh, foreign corporations, for example. They didn't have to report that, now they do. That's hung up on some litigation right now. That's the subject of some litigation. We aren't involved in our office, but just so you know, question mark around that one. Some contend that that is unconstitutional. We'll see what the courts say, but the litigation, the lawsuits in motion right now. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Raise your hand or just speak out. Okay, Mark, I'm sorry. Your question was in the chat. I apologize. No, no problem. <clears throat> I see Mark Bonhorst. Thanks for the sure. shout out at the beginning of your talk. Uh, League of Women Voters is not just for women. I'm a new member of Minneapolis chapter. So, um, I'm uh, interested in the in the election study that uh, is part of the legislation that passed this year. Right. Uh, it started off being a study of of ranked choice voting and could we? That was the original legislation. How you know how how can we do that? It got modified. I mean, I testified that I wanted it to be broader than ranked choice voting because I thought we should consider approval voting for president. Right. Um, and I think the final legislation is broader than ranked choice voting. So what I'm what I'm looking at right now is this, this new series of ideas from California and Alaska about open nonpartisan primaries as right. a possible way of really tackling the problem of polarization. So there were three original studies um, on this in Oregon, uh, Maryland, and Maine from uh, 1916 or 2016 to 2018, and then a, a um, an update study in Oregon in February of this year. And Colorado was doing a major new study uh, of this topic, and I'm in touch with the people who are who are doing that. So th uh, this is part of my grassroots organizing effort. <laughs> I have these ideas that I talked to you about before, and I was told, you know, you need to develop grassroots support for that. So everybody on the call, as well as you, Steve, I I'm I'm hoping that the league will consider updating its 2004 study to take a really serious look at the possibility of open primaries. Yes. And uh, it may be possible to concur with other leagues.
studies, particularly the Colorado study that's well underway. And I, I was looking at a draft of their study just today and yesterday. So I'm hoping there are people in the league who are interested in working with me on this. <laughs> Mark B913 at hotmail.com if you want to join the conversation. But mostly I'm so for, uh, I mean, I guess my question is questions are do you think that uh, considering the possibility of uh, open primaries and how that might work with ranked choice voting and other things will be part of your study? And are you aware of this and what do you think of it? Uh, yes. In general? No, great questions. And first of all, Mark, thank you. For those of you who don't know or, or just getting to know, because you're just getting to know him, Mark was a, a steady presence um, during a lot of these debates, offered a lot of really I would say really interesting angles on on uh, uh, on existing proposals, uh, whether it was national popular vote, which we haven't discussed yet, and other things. Um, but Mark, to your to your point, just to reacquaint everyone, one of the things that the legislature asked us to do is to embark upon and and um, uh, produce a, a study with uh, conclusions about, and it's, it's quite it is quite broad. You got your way, you got your wish, Mark, when you testified. Instead of a narrow study that was originally fashioned as a ranked choice voting study, this is more like an election systems change study. I, my word's not theirs, but that's basically what it is. And the runway is long. Uh, it's not due until sometime in early 2025, not 2024. And so to do that, we want to do it the right way. We want to um, uh, give justice to a variety of perspectives. And so one of the things we're doing is, and we asked for money for this and we got it, we are we will be contracting with one or more consultants to help us um, design the study. We don't wanna just say, hey, let's just randomly talk to a bunch of people. And so we've already reached out to Minnesota Management and Budget, which is the agency in Minnesota. And we're close, I think, to finalizing an agreement by which they would help us design and run the study with the help of maybe some outside consultants as well. So that's a long winded way of saying, Mark, that we're just getting our arms around the scope and we hope to bring in the public, perhaps you, perhaps others, on the scope scoping process of the design. How wide do we want to go? How narrow do we want to go? What's on the menu? Do we want to choose, you know, three prominent ideas and explore them in depth, or do we want to do something that casts a little bit of a wider net? To those not maybe immediately familiar with the idea that Mark is championing, this is one that a number of states, Louisiana, Alaska, California, in different ways have embraced, which is the idea of a, sometimes it's been called a jungle primary. Sometimes it's been called a, uh, you know, a nonpartisan, um, uh, or not, not a nonpartisan, but a sort of multipartisan primary. The idea being, as is practiced in California, for example, is top two finishers, regardless of party, make it to the general election. No different than you would have in say a Minneapolis mayoral race because they are not partisan elections. Here though, you would have it in partisan contests. So let's say you had eight candidates running for governor, three Republicans and five Democrats, I'll just say for the purpose of this argument, in 2026, the top two, regardless of party, even though it is a partisan election, that's how they do it in California, top two. And sometimes that means two Democrats. Sometimes that means two Republicans. Sometimes it means one of each. But top two, regardless of party, even in partisan contests, unlike we're used to that situation in like a mayor's race or city council race in, in a city like Minneapolis. But this would extend it to um, uh, to partisan races. And what Mark is talking about in Alaska is they add another layer, which is it's ranked choice voting top five. So that's yet another layer to add on it. Um, but those are all reforms that uh, um, could be the subject of the study, but we're still in the scoping phase right now. Thank you. I did Thank see you. two other questions here. Um, Jane Papagiorgio, she wants to know about those 400,000 Minnesotans who <coughs> do not vote. Yes. Are we doing any type of um, um, extending ourselves to try and get those people to vote? Oh, yes. We have a voter outreach department. In fact, Melanie, Melanie Hazlip is our director of voter outreach. She couldn't be, normally she would be with me tonight. She couldn't, she sends her regrets. Um, and she has been fantastic. She is building the team. We are hiring. Um, and, you know, we're one office. We can't do it alone. That's why we, re we rely on partners like the league, like community groups, faith groups, business groups, labor groups, all in nonpartisan voter outreach. Never, ever, ever do we tell a person how to vote, who to vote for, 
what political party uh, to be uh, allied with. It's all about voting itself. That's it. And so um, uh, we've had great success in the past, whether it's our youth voter engagement efforts. We started the first ever uh, 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 a mock election for high school students that's statewide. We have a contest that we call Democracy Cup among 62 colleges and universities in Minnesota, two-year, four-year, public, private, parochial, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a voting contest where we can track who voted on these campuses and we divide the schools into divisions and, and leverage competitive uh, impulses and rivalries and all the rest. Those are just some examples, but we are heavily engaged in voter outreach now, well before the presidential election of 2024. So, but we're always looking for a hand. We can't do it alone. We have to work with partners. We have to work with trusted voices. You know, our theme, our theory, our our way of operating when it comes to voter outreach is we can't be everywhere all at once, can't even be close to everywhere all at once. So we need to deal with trusted voices. Anywhere in any community, there's a trusted voice, whether it's a faith leader or a business leader, leader or um, you know, uh, uh, an elected official or an athlete, professional athlete or whatever, we try to leverage and rely on their trusted voice to get out information about um, the accessibility of voting and the wisdom and utility of voting at the same time. Thank you. Um, Lisa also has another question. She wanted to know what, um, did we pass anything to do with redistricting? Redistricting. Ah. And um, she stated here that LWV believes the responsibility for fair redistricting should be vested in an independent special commission with membership that reflects the, the diversity of the unit of government. Amen to that. Thank you to the league for over a decade since the la since before the last redistricting after the 2010 census. I know because I was in the legislature and the league has been totally consistent and totally persistent since then. I really applaud that. Uh, you have been a great partner in that. I used to, as a legislator, carry the bill to do exactly as you said, to have an independent commission like Iowa has, like Michigan has, like Arizona has, like California, <laughs> like a growing number of states have. Um, and that is, I think, overall a great approach. So no, the short answer to the question is no. There was nothing done this session that was meaningful or impactful around redistricting. That is the next frontier, in my judgment. And also, I believe strongly, as I know the league does, because we've had discussions years ago about this, the time to do it is now. The further away you are from the year ending zero, the better it is. Why? As we know, the year zero, year ending zero is when we have the decennial census in this country. But if you do redistricting reform in the year ending eight, nine, or zero, um, it's probably, it's, 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 to say it's doomed is probably too strong a word. I would say its chances are slim because the closer you get to the year ending zero, the more you have people on across the political spectrum gaming out who's likely to do better in the next election. And if you think your party is likely to do better in the next election, you're going to be more reluctant to embrace independent redistricting reform because you think there's a chance your party might run the table, so to speak, and be able to draw the districts that it wants. And this is true uh, in, uh, among Democrats. This is true among Republicans, in red states, in blue states. So the further away you can get it, I would say passing something in the year ending four or five or six or seven is optimal. And so we've got a little bit of time, but now is the time to do it. Great, thank you. And um, I wanted to say, Ellen, I'm going to save your question for the last word, and then I'm going to ask Ann Jones to. Hi, yeah. hello. Hi, Secretary Simon. Uh, so my question is about the national popular vote. Where are we in Minnesota huh. with the national popular vote for president and vice president? Thank you for that question. I literally could do an entire hour on this, as Mark knows. <laughs> so could he. Um, uh, it's something I feel passionately and strongly about. And the bottom line is we got it done this year. <gasps> For those of you not familiar with national popular vote, um, let me just zoom out for a second, as they say, and talk generally about the issue very quickly. So as I like to say, you know, uh, electoral votes, the better way to think of them is maybe it's just a point system, right? Um, uh, states get points under the constitution. 
Uh, the larger you are in population, the more points you get. The smaller you are in uh, population, the fewer points that you get, but they're points. That's all they are. They're points that elect the president of the United States. Critically, the Constitution is very clear, crystal clear, about how states are to allocate their points. The Constitution says totally clearly that states can decide how to allocate the points they get. It just so happens that 48 out of 50 states, including Minnesota, have chosen to allocate them on a winner-take-all basis. But that isn't in the Constitution. A lot of people wrongly assume that the Constitution says it's winner-take-all. If you win a particular state by one vote, you get all of their points. That is not true. In wow. fact, the opposite is true. The Constitution expressly, explicitly says, states, you're going to get these points. You decide how to allocate them. So if Minnesota, for example, to use a silly example, just to illustrate the point, if Minnesota wanted to say, you know what, here's our rule. We're going to allocate our 10 points to the tallest candidate. Whoever she or she may be from year to year, the tallest one is going to get our 10 points. Now, that's a really dumb idea, but probably constitutional because we get to decide how to allocate our points. So all that the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, as it's called, would say is we and other states will now agree that we are going to allocate our points to the winner of the national popular vote, so as to ensure that the winner of the presidency is always and forever going to be the person who got the most votes, period. Now, it's a compact, which means our obligation to do what I just said does not kick in until enough states do the same thing. And that number is enough states adding up to 270 electoral votes. Right now, it's at 205. We are the ones who brought it from 195 to 205. So 205 electoral votes worth of states have already done what we just did this year. So if 65 electoral votes more of states do it, it will then kick in. It will then go into effect. And it will mean that going forward, uh, we will be not abolishing the Electoral College, the opposite, using the Electoral College but to affect an outcome such that the person who gets the most votes nationwide will always become the next president. And we did that this year. Now, whether 270 will be achieved in two years or five years or 10 years or 20 years, I don't know. But we're in a position now so that if 65 electoral votes worth of states more adopt this, we will then be allocating our 10 points, our electoral, 10 electoral votes on the basis of who won the national popular vote. Great. Um, Jan, you, you do still have a question? Mm. I, yes, I, I actually, Jan Bitbo again. Yes, I actually have a question. It was so, you did so many wonderful things. What are the safeguards that if another party comes into, um, comes, takes, takes control, that these things will stay? Um, honestly, there's no safeguard. I mean, it is possible that um, a future legislature of whatever party could decide to repeal or change any of this. So um, there's no safeguard. None of these were constitutional changes. They're all in statute. They're all in regular law. So if legislative majorities backed up by a governor's signature ever decide to go in the opposite direction, they could. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, Ellen, then I Wharton, she has a question here, and I think it's probably going to be the last yep. one. Okay. What additional voter reforms, improvements would you like to see happen in Minnesota? Oh, yes. Thank you. Because we're not done. We're not um, going to rest on our laurels. We're not just going to say there's no more reform to be had or changes to be made. Um, uh, you know, there are many I could mention, but let me focus on one in particular because it's in, been in the news lately and, and for good reason. Artificial intelligence or AI, as it's known, poses a unique set of challenges and I would say even threats to our election system. Um, last week, I had the privilege of testifying before the US Senate Rules Committee chaired by Amy Klobuchar. She invited me to come testify on this subject. And there were other testifiers too, who did a really good job. Um, and the way I see AI is it's not necessarily a threat to our election system in and of itself, but it is, it, it, it does um, 
it, it does threaten to amplify existing threats. And I'm talking about misinformation and disinformation. You've all seen or at least heard about these deep fakes, these videos that appear real, that appear to show a real flesh and blood human being saying or doing something um, you know, accurately uh, when it's entirely manufactured. It doesn't take a great leap to figure out how that could be weaponized and misused when it comes to not only um, campaigning, showing a candidate or office holder saying something that she never said, um, but for election administration as well. Picture uh, a trusted person saying something about elections that's untrue. I gave the example earlier in this talk about the flyer from 20 or more years ago in a neighborhood. Now, instead of a paper flyer, imagine an image, a video purporting to show, seeming to show someone who is trusted and respected saying the very same thing about elections that is just false. So what do we do about it? Well, there are many things to do about it that are not legislative, but I think Congress has a role to play and the state has a role to play. One law that passed this year, and we'll see if it's enough, would police deep fakes to the kind of videos that I just talked about. An entirely fabricated video that is, is just not true. It, it's made up, it's manufactured based on someone's image and likeness. And it says that within 90 days of an election, no one can use um, uh, an, a, an AI image if, uh, if its intent is to affect an election or affect, uh, yeah, I think it's the affect an election. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's basically it. Will that be enough? I'm not sure. What I know is that both nationally and in Minnesota, there is great interest in the role that um, the law could play, that new laws could play in at least putting up some common sense guardrails, right? And there should be an exception for satire and parody and things like that. Of course there should be. But um, that's a whole... Um, area of possible legislating that I would just draw your attention to and that the league might want to do some thinking about. So I know we said that was the last question, but I have one more. Okay, one. And that is, <laughs> and that is um, around implementation of all of these laws. Yes. Do you see a role for us as a league Absolutely. to advocate? Yes. Yeah. I absolutely do. And you've already been doing it. At least many chapters have been. So I've been doing this too, since school started uh, a number of weeks ago. I've been doing a tour of high schools across the state talking about um, uh, pre-registration. So I've been to several. I, my first one was in Albert Lee, Minnesota. I did several in Minneapolis. I was in Rochester. And I'm continuing that over the coming weeks and months. But at nearly every school, not everyone, but nearly everyone, we coordinated these events with the local league chapter. So they were there uh, helping to register or pre-register 16 and 17 year olds, register the 18 year olds, pre-register the 16 and 17 year olds. So that's one very tangible thing that the, I know league chapters have already been doing. Another thing is just helping us get the word out about these new changes in law, particularly to those who have just had their rights restored, the 55,000 plus Minnesotans who have left prison behind, they've done their time, they're out have been out sometimes for years, sometimes for decades, and now need to understand that they have that right to vote back. So we'd be happy to work with your chapter or any chapter or any person, frankly, or any group in getting the word out in that way as well. And then there's just the more, um, I would say conventional, but it's, it's always important, voter outreach, getting facts out to people about polling places, method and means of voters as we approach the November 2024 election, that's gonna be critical. And so believe me, we will be calling on you. And uh, and we hope you'll call on us too if you have thoughts or ideas, things that we can and should be doing or do, should be doing more of or less of or doing better. Please, um, we have to have each other's backs. We're partners in this work. And sometimes when your partners are teammates, the best service you can do is tell your teammate how they could be better. So don't think that my tender feelings will be hurt if you reach out and say, hey, you know, you need to be doing more in Minneapolis, or you have an idea for us um, to be um, recruiting partners uh, uh, in a particular place or in a particular way. So we're, we're all pulling in the same direction here, and that's for maximum um, and informed voter turnout and participation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I guess that ends our civic buzz for October.
Okay. Thank you very much, Secretary Simon. And thank you all for your participation. Lots of great questions. And let everyone know that uh, we'll be putting this up on the website probably in the next two days. So more people can benefit from what we've learned. Can I say one last thing? Our website is a really good one-stop shop. Many of you know this. Our website is mnvotes.gov. That's mnvotes.gov. You can go there and find out not only where your polling place is by typing in your address, but you can find out who or what is on your ballot. If you're not sure uh, this fall, whether you have a city council race in your area or next year, if you're not sure if you're voting for county commissioner or which judges or whatever, you go to that website. You can also use that website to register or pre-register to vote. You can also critically use that website to order the ballot to come to you to vote from home if you don't want to go to a polling place or go to an absentee voting location. So all those and many other uh, um, conveniences await at mnvotes.gov. And I'm just okay. going to verbalize that we thank you yes. for all your work. Thank you. You have a cheering I, team out here. Thank my you. pleasure. <laughs> thank you for yours. You, you, you all are part of a tremendous public service. And you've been so consistent about it, too, through the years, even through the decades on these particular issues. And um, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Secretary. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.